the crux of it is if you get even a little bit of data, then you have something to talk about. If worse comes to worse and you have no data, you're in trouble. They had a plan, and every time they tried to execute their plan, something went wrong. You know, it's, uh, they, they were going to do lab experiments, but they could never get the lab thing going because they, they, they never got the equipment right and, and all of this. And, I, and they, they were going to take all this data on the plant. They hardly took any, and I remember, you know, the project was just going down the tube. So I remember going over there, and we had a meeting, and we sat for several hours, and we just discussed everything and worked through everything. And all of a sudden, the lights came on, and they actually finished the project and got a very good result. And I remember that, uh, that you know, focusing and turning around, and, and even with minimal data and everything, they still could think it through and figure out what's going on and get the answer that was needed. When you're forced to wring as much information out of that data as you can because you only have a little bit of it, it's surprising how much you can get. But at least in those kinds of projects that we had at those two stations, you really needed data. Uh, and if the experiment was, the equipment was a failure, so you never managed to get data, then you're in real trouble. There was a project in Waterford where they had a uh, wastewater, it was a, um, it was a clarifier. So they stick in wastewater, and there was supposed to be uniform distribution of the, of the, uh, the feed to the clarifier, and then it would be ejected to the, ultimately out into the, out into the river. So there were a lot of theories about what was wrong with the clarifier. It wasn't working. And so there were different groups that would come in and it was, we'd sit through the project presentations and the engineers and the managers would be arguing back and forth for, for an hour or more, all with different theories. And the student group had a great idea. They'd do a tracer study with a green dye. So they stuck a green dye in the clarifier, took a video of it. So they showed the video at the, pro the final presentation and it showed the green dye sort of pulled up in the middle. It was massive channeling. There wasn't any distribution in the clarifier. It was coming in and going straight out. Into the, into, the, into the exit. And it just, the whole room all of a sudden just got quiet because all of the theories, all of the ideas, and all of the, all of the uh, things that people thought were going on were totally untrue. And one picture showed the whole thing. It was, it was fantastic. We were the first practice school station uh, at General Electric. And we were working on a problem. We were about two and a half weeks into it, 10 days worth of data we'd taken only to find out that the equipment wasn't calibrated. Uh, that is a terrorizing um, realization for somebody. So we actually figured out a way to go back and reverse calibrate everything and save the data that we had gotten. You learn to be extremely resourceful, but I'll never forget the fear that gripped me when I realized I had let 10 days out of 28 run behind me. It was the very first project, and it was when a student was trying to do a heat balance on what's called a fin-fan condenser, finned tubes, uh, air-cooled condenser. And uh, he was walking around up top of the Stilson wrench in his back pocket, the Stilson wrench fell out, went clang, bang, bang down through the tubes and bent the fins and shut down <laughs> the piece of equipment and therefore the unit for a day. So I learned fast from that very practical experience that you'd better do everything you can do to make sure that there's no potential for that kind of thing happening again. Some of the projects we worked on in the paper mill uh, were instantly adopted by, this, by the plant management. The plant manager had this problem of these periodic explosions and as a team, we then set to work on, ex on explaining how these explosions occurred periodically. Sunlight was getting into these vacuum towers and uh, setting off these hydrogen chlorine explosions. They were absorbing chlorine and caustic soda. And uh, we did a lot of work, the group did a lot of work, was well documented, uh, explaining what the upper and lower explosive limits of hydrogen and chlorine were, and solved the problem by telling the plant manager to just drill a hole in the tower and bleed in air so that you get down below the explosive limit of hydrogen and chlorine. 
which we did. And as far as I know, to this day, they never had another explosion. The plant management were very happy that we had solved the problem. A report was written, it got back to MIT, and they said these guys are all wrong, they're going to have a hydrogen-oxygen explosion. Uh, we come down and explained that we were beyond the explosive limits of hydrogen and oxygen, beyond the explosive limits of hydrogen and chlorine. We had done the research on it, uh, and the plant management was, was very happy. So we had to defend our position, and in front of all the uh, Doc Lewis and all the other people who uh, listened to us, and at the end of the end of the uh, defense, there was applause by the by the professors at, at MIT. Because this was a fairly extensive computer program, we had three boxes of cards at that point. Uh, they only allowed us to run after midnight. So uh, one of the intensities, in fact, was that that plus another project that I did. We could only do after midnight on graveyard shift. <laughs> and of course, during the day, they expected us to work. So, um, and in the end, we were unsuccessful uh, because it turned out that w we didn't understand enough about numerical calculations to realize that you don't go along at steady state and then all of a sudden change things because the computer program will not be stable. So we used to be in, the, in there about quarter after 12, and we'd put in the three boxes, and the operators would say, I bet it's not going to work tonight. And we'd say, oh, no, it's got to work tonight. And then we'd go in, and everything was going along just fine. And you could tell by the sounds from the, the uh, tape drives that, oh, yeah, everything was going along. And all of a sudden, and they'd say, see, I told you. <laughs> so we'd go back and have to go do it. And again, what you learned from that was tenacity. There were two of us on the project. And so what we we're going to do was, okay, so let's go see what's really coming off the stack. We have these uh, tubes we can take samples with and, and see what's coming off the top. So, so okay, we're going to go up to the roof. You go through, it's a batch reactor, you go through the process and we'll be up there for the whatever hours uh, it takes for this to do and, uh, and we'll measure the, uh, what's, what's coming off the stack. So we get up there and right away all of a sudden we see this steam coming up the stack and that's because they're put on the steam injector create a little negative pressure in the reactor uh, while they're putting in the, uh, the feeding in the chemicals and I think one of the chemical the chemical they were feeding in was hydrochloric acid and so we're, we're up on the roof and uh, all of a sudden it starts the steam starts condensing and raindrops start falling on us and okay I look at my, it was winter, it was, it was November or December, and I had a jacket on, and I look at my jacket, and there are holes in my jacket, and then we realized it's raining hydrochloric acid on us.